Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All we have cause to plead. Draw near. Give attention. You shall be heard. God save these United States, great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court of Florida, please be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. Before we turn to the case on the docket today, I want to welcome uh, to today's session uh, some special guests we have. We are honored to have Florida educators uh, with us here today who are at the court to learn about the judicial branch and the appellate process. Uh, they are here as part of our annual Florida Supreme Court Teacher Institute. Uh, this is a program in which we select teachers from middle and high schools throughout Florida to join our justices here at the court in a week-long professional development opportunity. Today, we have about 25 middle and high school civics, government, and law teachers and their mentors. Uh, our justices serve as faculty throughout the week, and I want to say for myself and for all my colleagues, we are very delighted that you are here for this session of court and that you are here this week for the Florida Supreme Court Teacher Institute. We thank you for your service to our state and to the children of our state. Now we turn to the business at hand, McGraw versus the state of Florida. Your Honors, Benjamin Eisenberg, on behalf of the petitioner Byron McGraw, I've reserved four minutes of my time for rebuttal. We're here today on a certified question of great public importance related to the constitutionality of a provision of Florida's implied consent statute, which permits officers to perform warrantless blood draws on motorists suspected of DUI who have been rendered unconscious and who are receiving treatment at a hospital. Now, before I get into the merits of my argument, I will note, as the state filed the supplemental authority, that as of last month, the United States Supreme Court accepted review of the same issue in Mitchell versus Wisconsin. It has been set for the October session. I am requesting that this court rule on this issue, but otherwise, if it does not, to at least hold it until the United States Supreme Court has ruled. Now, on the merits, the United States Supreme Court has twice addressed the constitutionality of warrantless blood draws. And in both instances, the state or government... Counsel, can I ask you um, for a, a why? that request, given the general principles of judicial restraint and the fact that we have a conformity clause in the Florida Constitution with respect to Fourth Amendment issues, why wouldn't we, um, recognizing that whatever the Supreme Court of the United States rules will be the law, of course, throughout the country, but in Florida, why would, not, why would we keep this? Oh, of course, Justice Lawson, for, for right now, there are two interests at play with that. One is that if this court wants to provide its voice to the United States Supreme Court, they only recently accepted review of the case that it can. That's one issue. But currently, as for Mr. McGraw, he is currently in the pipeline. So if he is entitled to relief under the United States Supreme Court's ruling, then he should obtain it. And furthermore, as similar to this case, uh, this court's decision in Carpenter, uh, right now, we are sitting here, the Fourth District Court of Appeal has authorized this type of search. However, it's certified a question of great public importance. If this court were to discharge jurisdiction, then people within the interim between this court's discharge of jurisdiction and the United States Supreme Court uh, ruling may not be able to take advantage of the exclusionary rule because the case is no longer pending. So that's why I'm asking your honors to either rule on the issue or to hold it until the United States Supreme Court has ruled. Would, would that make the good faith exception issue to the war, to, to the, the most important issue for you today? Because if, if we agreed with the fourth district in their ruling on the good faith exception, then it would not matter how this came out at the U.S. Supreme Court, correct? Well, that is in some capacity except for that the good faith exception, yes, it would apply specifically as to my client. It is a very important issue, but at the same time, uh, there are other people that may be in the pipeline that this issue has come up, for which, if you were to deny relief uh, right now... But, but the question, I think, was, if, if all of that being true, we accept what you say, 
in the in the real issue that we've got to uh, decide in this case, the the good faith issue, and because it, the Supreme Court's going to decide the other issue. That is true. That is true. That, but that is also assuming that this court does not rule on it before the United States Supreme Court has done so. And if the, and if that is the decision that this court makes, if it decides to hold, then yes, as applied to this specific case, the good faith exception would be the most important issue as to this specific case, because as Justice Kennedy just stated, uh, the United States Supreme Court will rule on the issue. Uh, if you want to jump from the time being to the good faith exception, I will note the state in its answer brief has referred several times to the good faith exception to the warrant requirement, but actually it's the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. We do not get to the good faith exception unless there is a Fourth Amendment violation. That is the point that was made in the United States versus Leon. It was also reiter reiterated in Illinois v. Crawl and most recently by Chief Justice Roberts in Hine versus North Carolina. But well, we're not required to reach the Fourth Amendment issue if we decide on good faith, are we? Can't we just assume it away? Uh, no, because then there will be, the problem with that type of theory is that then it becomes self-defeating. Uh, if you do not rule on the Fourth Amendment violation and simply say that this is good faith, then there becomes no ruling from this court or others. Hasn't the U.S. Supreme Court addressed that exact argument in the sovereign immunity context where there's a two-part analysis? A, is there a clear constitution, is there a constitutional violation in second was it clearly established at the time that it happened? Very similar to the good faith concept. And the Supreme Court has said that the lower courts are f free and clear to decide it however they want to in whichever order, even when faced with the argument that there will not be quote unquote constitutional development like you're arguing here. Um, well, is there, no, let me ask it this way. Mm -hmm. Is there any case law, is there any statute uh, compelling us to rule on the constitutional violation first before we decide on good faith? Yes, and as I wrote in, or as I quoted from United States versus Leon, the United States Supreme Court has rejected the argument that application of a good faith exception search is conducted pursuant to warrants will preclude review of the constitutionality of the search or seizure, denying needed guidance to the courts or freeze Fourth Amendment law in its present state. And that is because, and I'm quoting from the United States Supreme Court, there is no need for courts to adopt the inflexible practice of always deciding whether the officer's conduct manifests an objective good faith before turning to the question of whether the Fourth Amendment has been violated. There's no need, but there's no constitutional or compelling requirement to do that, is there? Well, there is a compelling requirement, in the, or there's no compelling requirement. A case can be decided on good faith, but that the, the problem with doing so is that guidance should be provided to the parties, especially in a case like this where we're currently pending. But, but here you've already recognized the guidance is going to come from the U.S. Supreme Court. It will come from the United States Supreme Court. However, people within the interim may not be able to take advantage of, the exclusionary rule may not apply to them, because if this court discharges jurisdiction, for example, then people who are currently in the pipeline, such oh, as let, Mr. Let's Ro assume we're not going to discharge jurisdiction. Okay. Let's assume that we're going to hold it in abeyance. The question is, should, should we address then the good faith exception? Can we address a good faith exception uh, solely? Uh, well, first, I, I, I would say no, because the first thing that you have to do is you have to decide the Fourth Amendment issue, which, as you, your honors, have recognized, is something that's currently before the United States Supreme Court. So, for example, in the decision below, the Fourth District Court of Appeal majority never had to get to the good faith exception because they found that there was no Fourth Amendment violation. So we only get to the good faith exception if there's a Fourth Amendment violation. That will, de that will depend upon what your honors rule on the merits of this case or depending on what the United States Supreme Court does eventually. But on the, note, on the good faith exception, getting to the merits of that argument, um, the whole point of the good faith exception is the whole portion of the is, is to deter future Fourth Amendment violations. And, and this decision from 2017, Carpenter v. State, provides a good analysis for determining the case, uh, this case at issue. In Carpenter, um, you, had a, you had a decision, Smallwood 1, which authorized a type of warrantless search. However, it certified a question of great public importance. Before this court decided Smallwood, the officers in that case that were within that jurisdiction performed a warrantless search pursuant to Smallwood 1, and then later that decision was invalidated. But the counsel, that's a case law exception or a case law grant of authority uh, creating an exception to the warrant requirement. Here, there's a statute directly on point, which you agree is on point, you just believe that it's unconstitutional as applied to the circumstances of this case. Um, if a police officer is acting to, to a statute which has not been held to be unconstitutional, um, which no one has suggested, which no case has suggested is unconstitutional as of right now, 
how can that possibly be an absence of good faith? Well, Justice Locke, I would disagree that no case had at that time uh, showed that it was unconstitutional because I believe that the Fifth District's decisions in Williams and Lyles, both of which were what, in existence. Weren't, the, weren't those for separate provisions of the statute? It didn't apply to 1C that applies here? Well, just, yeah, that is correct, Justice So how can, how, if that's the case, how can it possibly be that following 1C um, is anything other than a good, anything other than acting in good faith on a statute that has not been held by any court in the entire state to be unconstitutional? Because, because the statute at play in Williams was section 316.1932, which is the same provision at issue here. I know it's a different subsection, but the holding of Williams was not specific to subsection 1A, which was an issue in Williams. They specifically said, and I'm quoting from the Fifth District Court of Appeal, statutory implied consent is not equivalent to Fourth Amendment consent. They also said within Williams, the defendant did not necessarily consent to a breath test when he got behind the wheel of his car. So we have a holding that says that statutory implied consent as a whole, and which statutory implied consent within Florida is part of a trilogy. There are three specific provisions to it, 316.1932, through 34. They are all part of a trilogy, and they have held that statutory implied consent is not the functional equivalent. That was the case, the only case on point at let, the time. Let me ask you this, it, but, but if, if we disagree and believe that, that no court had declared this portion of the statute that's at issue in this case unconstitutional, um, under Illinois, Illinois v. Cruel, you would agree that, that Good, the good faith exception would apply because the officer can rely on a presumed, presumptively constitutional statute, correct? Well, I disagree, uh, Justice Lawson, only because there are exceptions within Illinois v. Kroll. Uh, the posture in Illinois v. Kroll was different because in Illinois v. Kroll there was a statute that had never been challenged in any capacity. I understand that this specific subdivision was not challenged. However, in there, there was no reason at all for the officer to challenge the statute other than it went, he, relied, he reasonably relied on the statute, it was then challenged and it was overturned on appeal, but the officer, having no guidance in that regard, would not have no idea. An officer in Officer DeSantis's position in this case would have, at, at the time of the search, have seen that case law said that statutory implied consent is not equivalent to Fourth Amendment consent. So we have an officer, the accident occurs, and the, and the trial judge in this case did a, a great job of outlining the factual posture and, and outlined how easy it would have been in Palm Beach County to obtain a warrant. This was an accident that occurred at 8 a.m. Can I ask you uh, some questions on the merits um, sure. in regards to the Fourth Amendment issue? So would you agree with me that if, uh, at least under current case law of the Florida Supreme Court and the state of Florida, that if I take a luggage into an airport and hand it over to the security guard to put through an x-ray machine, that that luggage is then subject to search, that I've consented uh, to that subject, to that luggage being consented, I've consented that luggage being searched. Well, that is the case law that was established by this court in Shapiro, but it wasn't. You would agree, you just would agree with that principle of law? With qualification. It, okay. it, it, do, you agree, do you agree that if I'm a prison guard um, and I walk into a prison that I've consented to a pat down uh, search of myself and anything that's in my pockets or shoes or anything like that? Again, I would say with qualification. Okay. Because, you know, the state has cited these cases, Shapiro, Duran, Clark, and Morgan, and all of them, none of them say that by virtue of simply walking into an airport, you're subjecting yourself to deeply personal searches such as warrantless blood draws. Uh, agreed. But it, it, in the airport context, in large part, it's because you knew that you were subject to a search by going in there. In other words, the evidence showed that by going into the airport, you knew that someone would be subject to search. I think the evidence there indicated that 20 times before, this particular individual had been subject to a search, and therefore he knew that that was going to be the case, correct? Yes, Your Honor, and that's what, that's what I was saying with the distinction, is that there was a record in that case to show that the implied consent, which was done through conduct, was supported by the totality of the so circumstances. If, if the evidence here had suggested, let's assume, assume for the moment, that the, the record evidence here was that the defendant um, remembered signing uh, when he got his driver's license the statute that gave informed consent, had actually looked at his driver's license and said, read the bottom, I am giving informed consent, knew of the informed consent statute, I have even read it recently, um, and I still drove, I still drank, I still got in an accident that resulted in me being unconscious. Would that record be sufficient to, uh, to, give cons to show consent by conduct? I don't believe so. I believe that the- So even that action, which would be equivalent to what happened in Clark and what happened in Shapiro, would, would 
not be the case? How do we distinguish those two? Well, I think there's a, a substantial distinction, first off, in the fact that the search in Shapiro was a, uh, was a luggage. It was not piercing the skin, which the United States Supreme Court has, rejected, uh, has repeatedly stated is a substantial invasion, a, a substantial invasion of a person's privacy. Well, that, that, that's, that's true that it's, it's an invasion of, of, of a person. But the question is, if you consent mm -hmm. and you understand that that is something that you're consenting to, how is that a violation? Well, the United States Supreme Court in Birchfield indicated that there are limits to what a person consent to. Under, this, under that reasoning, what the state is arguing here, they could consent to anything so long as it's done by legislative proclamation. How do you square that with Skinner? And I'm reading from Skinner here. We, also, we said also that the intrusion occasioned by a blood test is not significant, since such tests are a commonplace in these days of periodic physical examinations and experience with them teaches that the quantity of blood extracted is minimal and that for the most people, and that for most people, the procedure involves virtually no risk, trauma, or pain. Schmermer thus uh, confirms, this, quote, society's judgment that blood tests do not constitute an unduly extensive imposition on an individual's privacy and bodily integrity. How do you square that? with what you just said about how it's so much le more invasive than rifling through someone's private belongings at the middle of an airport or patting someone's entire body down physically um, when they enter into a jail. Well, Justice Locke, the most recent decision on the case was uh, Birchfield, and that was the exact distinction that they made, is that... No, the distinction they made in Birchfield is that it's more invasive than a breath test. Yes. It certainly is. There's no question about that. And no one's saying that there's not a privacy interest or it's invasive. But regarding how specifically invasive it is, the court, and I, as I understand it, Skinner is still good law, has said it is not significant. How can you say an intrusion that is not significant is so much more significant than batting, patting down someone's personal body space, touching their, someone's body, or rifling through their private belongings uh, in the middle of an airport in front of everybody? Uh, well, the, patting down someone's personal space is not extracting, is not entering a portion of their body, extracting a portion touching of their body. Touching someone's private parts is not signif more significant than in the medical setting, in the private of a medical tent, putting a, a little needle and extracting a little bit of blood? I disagree, Your Honor, because as decades of, of changes in technology have shown, and as was recognized in Birchfield, not only is it uh, intrusive to take someone's blood, but obtaining someone's blood can be used for purposes other than merely uh, administering blood alcohol testing. In fact, it can show a lot about a person's history, a lot about um, ancestry or can be used as that's the extent, databases. That's the extent of the test, though. But here, there's nothing indicating in the statute that the test can be done for DNA but purposes. Counsel, it, isn't the more fundamental difference with Skinner, though, that the court in that case characterized that as a context where because of the pervasive regulation of the railroads that, and because these, uh, these tests were being done not necessarily based on individualized uh, suspicion and not necessarily in connection with law enforcement, that the court basically said we're not even looking at this in terms of a, of a warrant. Justice Meadies, I agree completely. The Skinner decision was based on the special needs doctrine. And the special needs doctrine only comes for government regulation when there is a special need for programs and its primary purpose is not general interest in crime control. And is, isn't that arguably the same thing that's going on in airports? It, it, can you repeat the question? Isn't that arguably the same thing that's going on in airports where it's not, again, not necessarily for crime detection, but more in terms of, you know, not targeting people individually and not sort of a post hoc kind of law enforcement purpose? Well, I, I put a footnote in my reply brief. I also discussed in my reply brief how no case has said that a blood draw pursuant to DUI implied consent statutes has been upheld as a special need. But I also put a footnote in my reply brief that, mo that although courts decades ago relied on consent in the airport context, Context, most nowadays have relied on the administrative search and the special needs doctor. How is a post-test, a, a post-railroad -ac accident test, f any more for investigative or regulatory purposes than a post-accident blood test for someone who has a driver's license when the evidence is to be used at an administrative hearing to revoke someone's driver's license? Isn't it exactly the same thing to investigate cause and to uh, uh, have administrative hearings, which was exactly the issue in Skinner? Well, there is a difference between administrative and criminal proceedings. I'll say that first off. But they discuss in Skinner that when there is a railroad accident, it is a catastrophic event. There is, it's, it's more than just an investigation for police purposes. The railroad themselves need to know who is, you're requiring railroad employees to basically determine probable cause and who is potentially drinking, making those lines. Instead, they, require, they instituted 
uh, the federal government instituted bright line rules to effect because it was going to be railroad employees that were making the determination of who was drinking and driving, who should have their blood drawn. And instead, they applied rigid rules because there was a special need for ensuring the safety of railroads. Because once again, when there is a railroad... How is a post-accident test? I understand pre-accident, meaning everyone who walks into a railroad who is an employee gets tested beforehand. I understand exactly that. This was, these were authorized post-accident tests to investigate. How is that any different and any more of a harm for someone driving drunk and causing uh, issues on the road to all the people that are driving on our roads to have a post-accident test to determine what the cause of the accident was, why it happened, and to have administrative hearings over that person <coughs> should still be authorized for the privilege of driving in this state? Because, this, because we are in a criminal proceeding in this case, and this is not, it's not being brought in for an administrative purpose. The purpose in Skinner was specifically f to help the railroad companies to administer and, and ensure safety. It was, not, it was not purely for prosecutorial purposes, which is what we have here. Now, if how, how is that? You, you assume that it's here, but why is there? We have a, a strong regulatory framework for revoking someone's license as a result of that as a collateral consequence of drinking and refusing consent. How is, can we say that this is purely criminal when that is exactly what's going on here? Well, there's a difference between administrative penalty, and that's what the United States Supreme Court recognized in Birchfield. There's a difference between administrative and civil penalties and criminal penalties. And it's for that reason that when you impliedly consent, and that's, let me just return to that point. When they discuss implied consent statutes like we have in what was uh, endorsed by the United States Supreme Court, both in McNeely and Birchfield, they're talking about implied consent statutes that provide a bit of coercion to parties so they will provide actual consent. So in that regard, and this has been decided in uh, Neville decades ago, you can place certain conditions in implied consent to coerce someone to provide the consent, and those can be civil remedy or civil punishments, losing their license, things along those lines. But the United States Supreme Court in Birchfield recognized that there must be limits to what you consent to. It's for that reason that they cannot have consent that's implied consent that's tied to criminal penalties, and it's for the same reasons that you cannot have implied consent that waives fundamental rights, the Fourth Amendment of which is one that dates back to our country's founding. And I say that I'm almost at my time, so over. Uh, counsel, you have you have consume virtually all yes. the time. Uh, I will nonetheless afford you two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, may it please the court. My name is Richard Volantes and I represent the state of Florida. Um, Justice Luck, Justice Lawson, I, I agree with you 100%. This is a situation where in, in a couple months, I believe the oral argument is set for April 23rd, the United States Supreme Court is going to hear this and it is going to be controlling as far as the Fourth Amendment issue. However, I don't believe the court should even get to the Fourth Amendment issue because as your honors has pointed out, um, in Singletary, this court has said courts should not pass upon the constitutionality of statutes in the case where the question arises may be effectively disposed of on other grounds. We have a case here that regardless of which way, either if this court wanted to, direct, to address the merits or the United States Supreme Court, whichever way they go, if they say it's okay, it's not okay, we still have a situation where every judge has looked at this case and said the good faith exception applies because as Justice Locke pointed out, we have a statute that is specifically on point. The statute's been around for at least according to my research over 50 years now. And I don't know what a police officer is supposed to do when he knows of a statute that's been in existence for so long, comes up on a scene. I mean, it was a pretty spectacular crash at 7.30 in the morning on a weekday. He comes in, assesses the situation, smells the alcohol from the defendant, from his, from his breath, from his body, and from the vehicle. Why is your opposing counsel, though, not... not right as a matter of policy that if we and other courts of the state continue to duck the constitutionality issue, because these are almost always going to come up in the criminal context, I guess it could come up in the civil context, but much less likely. Um, if we continue to duck that and find on good faith, how are we, and assume away the constitutional issue, how are we ever going to decide that issue? In other words, at some point, someone's got to decide it, right? Well, you have to decide it, Your Honor, but I think, as I just said from Singletary, if, if you've got, I, I mean, there are issues that come up. There's not a specific, like in this case, there's a specific statute that addressed the officer's conduct. A lot of these Fourth Amendment issues aren't necessarily 
based upon a specific statute. You have searches, incident to arrest. There's a whole panoply of Fourth Amendment issues that come before the court that are not just addressing or attacking the constitutionality look, look, of a statute. And I guess that let me, let me ask my this, response. Let me ask it this way. Can you cite a single case from this court where we said, we assume there is a Fourth Amendment violation, but find it that there's good faith here? Or do we almost always, in every single instance that you can remember, go through the Fourth Amendment analysis and then say, despite the violation, we find that there's a, there, the officer acted in good faith? Well, the only case I have off the top of my head is, is Singletary, and I don't know that it was a Fourth Amendment context, but it was, you know, we have a welfare fraud statute, it's unconstitutional, and this court did not address whether the welfare fraud statute was unconstitutional. They said, hey, look, there was a trouble. There was a problem with Speedy here. Even though it's before us, even though we can decide it, we are not deciding that issue that we have before us, which gave us jurisdiction. We're going to say there was no Speedy in this case. And, and that's just a particular tenet of law because the court needs to defer to the will of the legislature. Now, if the legislature goes out and passes a law that is blatantly unconstitutional, Obviously, the court steps in and does its job and does what it has to do. But in this case, where you have something that's been around and accepted for so long, and especially when in Birchfield, um, the particular language to me in Birchfield that's controlling, because they go through and it was all based upon search incident to arrest. They said, categorically, search incident to arrest, breath test is OK. Categorically, search incident to arrest, blood test is not on penalty of um, being a crime if you refuse. Now, right after that, they said, our prior opinions have referred approvingly to the general concept of implied consent laws that impose civil penalties and evidentiary consequences on motorists who refuse to comply, which is what Florida does. And then it, it says, petitioners do not question the constitutionality of those laws, and nothing we say here should be read to cast doubt on them. So, in my opinion, nothing whatsoever in Birchfield says that because there's more than half the states have similar laws to Florida. And I think that's why but, they included that language but, in there. But isn't the, the, the issue, if you read um, uh, McNeely, McNeely basically says you can't have a per se uh, law that says that a, uh, a blood draw is, is improper. I don't think that's what they said, Justice Lagoa. What they said was it's not a per se, basically a per se exigency, because there's all different kinds of exceptions to the Fourth well, Amendment. In McNeely, they, they said exigency. whether a warrantless blood test of a drunk driving suspect is reasonable must be determined on a case by case basis on the to based on the totality of the circumstances. So you can't have a per se rule. And in essence, aren't, isn't the state asking us to make a per se rule based on the implied consent statute? I don't know that it's necessarily saying it can't be a per se rule in general because the, in Birchfield, they turned around and did create a per se rule. They said search into incident to arrest, per se, you get the breath test. So if we want to say that Birchfield overruled McNeely on that point, I would have to say it did, because if that language you're quoting from McNeely says you cannot have a per se rule, well, then they turned around and ex ex established a per se rule in Birchfield. Just it's like, play out for me. Sorry, on the good faith okay. issue, just play out for me. If we decide, we again assume away the violation and decide that they acted in good faith here, how is the issue ever going to be decided? Well, I think the issue is going to be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in, in the okay. OA in two months. And then what if, the, what if the U.S. Supreme Court says, you know, this is a really tough case and we're divided and it's 414, which happens sometimes up there. But we all agree on good faith here, so we're going to rule on that. In other words, you have a fractured plurality um, mm -hmm. on one issue, in other words, no holding, and, and then you have good faith there. Um, how, play it out for me. Okay. How is this ever going to be decided? Well, I, I, eventually it's going to have to be decided head on. But I why? why? If, if you can always rule on good faith because the statute is there. Well, because you're going you're to have a situation, Your Honor. I mean, in this case, the facts are borne out. The trial court found it. Even Judge Gross, the dissenting judge, found it. We had good faith here. There's going to be a case, believe it or not, where there isn't good faith. But, but why? Because if the statute is, is as it says and as clear and as long-standing as you've articulated to mm -hmm. us, and I tend to agree with you, okay. if, we, if, if everyone says we're assuming away the violation um, and, and never rules on it, then no police officer would know that that statute is unconstitutional. Well, we're going to have to look at the fact that U.S. Supreme Court has taken this up, okay? And there's, according to my 
research and looking into the Mitchell case, you know, this isn't something that is uniform nationwide. According to the Mitchell briefs, there's 29 states, which is a majority, that have a, a statute similar to Florida's. Well, guess what? That means there's 21 that don't. So there is a considerable percentage of the, the states across the country that, I mean, for example, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is one of the cases cited by the defendant that says, hey, look, you have a situation where you've got the unconscious driver, but in Pennsylvania law, they have the expressed right to refuse. And because the defendant in that case was unconscious and could not exercise his express right to refuse, that's a situation where the, where the issue could be decided if Pennsylvania But, but in a state like up. Florida where we have the law that we do, I, I'm interested in Justice Luck's question and, and wonder if, um, if the U.S. Supreme Court does not decide that the statute is unconstitutional, either because they rule that it's constitutional or because they can't put together a majority, wouldn't the good faith exception still apply because the statute is valid and there, I mean, that we have a conformity clause, we can't do anything different. If the U.S. Supreme Court does not hold it unconstitutional, wouldn't that be the answer that law enforcement can rely on it in good faith? Well, I believe they can, as I said in my brief, the law enforcement can rely on it until it is deemed unconstitutional judicially. Um, and let, let me ask you this. Um, in in Carpenter, there was, a, I think, a three-person dissenting opinion mm -hmm. that expressed the view that the majority opinion in Carpenter narrowed the good faith exception significantly mm -hmm. and in very problematic ways that the minority, that, the, that I didn't and some others uh, think was appropriate. Um, is there anything in the majority opinion in Carpenter that would make it problematic for us to um, find good faith here without addressing? No, as a matter of fact, as uh, I believe I'm going to put in a brief, I think Carpenter actually s supports applying the good faith exception in this case because the, the cases the defendant ro relies on, one of which was Williams. Well, Williams was something that not only didn't ad address the specific statute, but in Williams, they did what they did, and then they took an appeal. So just like the Carpenter case, we had a situation where there was unsettled law in Florida. Now, you've got a direct statute saying, I'm allowed to do this. You have unsettled law from but the I mean, fifth PCA. Carp it, 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 maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, okay. but I think Carpenter, could it be fairly read to say that if the law is unsettled, law enforcement has to always get a warrant? They, they, I I, I didn't interpret it okay. that way, Your Honor, um, especially when you've, when you've got something that is directly I mean, on point. In, what, what Carpenter, in Carpenter, what you had was a, a, a DCA opinion that was the only court that had addressed it, so it was controlling throughout the state. Correct. Um, which, and the argument was that law enforcement ought to be able to rely on that. Right. But the majority said no, because the question was pending here that that created some uncertainty and that just that mere fact of uncertainty according to Carpenter means that good faith cannot apply. Right. right. Um, and and my, why, how would you apply that analysis to this context? The well, majority I would apply the analysis because at, at least in the Carpenter context, the DCA opinion that they relied on was, to my recollection, directly on point. Okay, we don't have the directly on point. Right, but it was directly here. on point in favor of saying that law enforcement right. could. They could. Yeah. And, but, but when Carpenter went on, didn't they do an analysis of, well, don't know that I agree with the analysis, but the thing was it's pending review, and this is, as Your Honor said, this but is, created this is a, certain. But, but this was new case law that the cops used to rely on for good faith. Okay, we don't have a situation, I think there was a mention to it. It's a big- I mean, But uh, wouldn't, wouldn't Lyles have created as much uncertainty with respect to this issue as the mere fact that someone had filed a notice of appeal and sought a review in our court on the case that was controlling in the entire state of Florida? I don't think it could have been reasonable to rely on Lyles, Your Honor, because it came out about a week No, the question is, speech. under Carpenter, I think, isn't the question whether Lyles would create enough uncertainty that a law enforcement officer 
ought to know that this is a question that the courts haven't really decided yet, um, which, according to the Carpenter majority, is, as I understand it, would mean that you can't rely in good faith on. Well, my understanding of the Carpenter was, look, you have a brand new DCA case, and it's in flux, it's pending before the Florida Supreme Court, and they said we can't reasonably rely on it, where we have a situation where, and, and it's not a state, in my opinion, where anything is in flux. We have a law on the books for 50 years, and that was one of the things in the analysis. How could a cop on the street say, okay, I've got this law for 50 years, but the 5th DCA comes out with this, this opinion on a different issue, on a different statute, but me as a police officer, I'm going to go out and interpret that to say, oh, no, I I can't comply with the Florida law I've been using for the last 50 years, even though no court of competent jurisdiction has said that's not good anymore. I, I mean, it, it really would be putting law enforcement in an untenable position. It, so you, thanks. Can I ask you a question on the merits? Yes, Your Honor. So is your position that when states give uh, people the opportunity, states with an implied consent law, and when they give people an opportunity to revoke their consent, and refuse the test once probable cause has been found and the officer actually tries to initiate the test. Is it your view that that's basically a matter of grace? Because by accepting a license and driving on the roads, the person, at that, at that point, the consent has already been affected. And if instead a state wanted to have a policy where they just said, hey, sorry, you've, you, you've already consented and we're going to do the blood test whether you at the time say that it's okay or not, that's not, you know, you've, the, the consent has already happened. Are we talking in the context of this case with unconscious people I'm just people asking no? in general with implied consent Okay, in, in general, it's, it's pretty clear. You sign your license, as Justice Locke pointed out, hey, I'm consenting to all these tests that are required by law. But the law is also pretty clear that, you know, just like a Fourth Amendment search, the cops come to your house, they knock on the door, can I search? Sure you can, they get into my foyer, I say, uh-uh, get out, I don't want you anymore. You can do that. However, what but we've done here- The statute allows you to, but what I'm asking is, is that a matter of grace? Is that a choice that the state made that they didn't have to make? Would it be constitutional for a state to say, look, we're only gonna look at the consent question at one point, and that is when we give you your license and when you accept it, and we will deem you at that point to have consented, and if we then decide we wanna give you a blood test where there's been probable cause, then we can do that, under the, as an, and invoke the consent exception. I'm not sure, it could be, again, because I, I just commented, it seems the case law is pretty clear that Consent can be revoked. So but isn't, that, but isn't that the position? Per isn't that the position that the unconscious person is in, basically? No, the unconscious position. The unconscious person is in the position of look. I'm signing the license. I'm right. driving a. Dri I am driving a dangerous instrumentality on the states of Florida, and. Under those situations, guess what? I gotta play by the rules of the game. And one of the rules of the game is, beforehand, I consent to these tests. But how, now, how can a person who is unconscious have fewer rights than a person who is conscious? Actually, I don't see how they have fewer rights. It seems like they could end up with more rights because in court, But, you, but just you're as saying that, that the person who's conscious has the right to revoke, correct? I say every, everyone. But yes. Well, you're saying the person who's unconscious has the right to revoke? If it's possible. That seems to be <laughs> somewhat <rather>. fictitious. <laughs> Am I, I mean, missing something there? Um, it's, it's, I would think for an unconscious person it would be very difficult to revoke. But the thing is, <laughs> it's, it, it's deemed... I appreciate the concession. <laughs> but, 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 but that's why the question is, don't they then have fewer rights? Because at that point, if a person is unconscious, why then could the officer DeSantis not go uh, and get a warrant or apply for a warrant? And if he was concerned that, uh, you know, um, the defendant was going to walk out, all of a sudden become awake and mm -hmm. become uh, and walk out the door, you can have an officer there and say, we're going to place him under arrest or under probable cause, mm -hmm. and he is detained, he is not free to leave, and I'm going to apply for a warrant. Well, it's not a matter of if he could, Your Honor. His His conduct in this case was specifically authorized by law. And again, this is... I understand that, but my okay. question is, there is no... He could have done that, the officer, correct. correct. But he was relying on the implied consent statute. A valid Florida statute at the time this incident occurred. And, and I would say it, it seems the defense is trying to flip this statute on its head. It's not 
you, you sign your license and yeah, you agree to abide by the rules of the road, but yeah, I'm really going to ignore them. And that's why well, it is called implied can, consent. You have already well, consented at the gate by conduct. Let, let's back up a little bit. In the Fourth Amendment context, is uh, consent is consent something we look at on a categorical basis, or do we look at the facts and circumstances of each case? Typically, on the on the case by case basis, right. but they do some. Really? W which case looks at consent on a categorical basis? I, I don't know. I, I, I walked into the building this morning and, and I was searched and they took my property from me and I'm assuming that was based on my applied consent. Okay, great point. So if we had an evidentiary hearing and you said, I've been to the courthouse a bunch of times, I know they search me every time, I know there's a policy to do that, that would be evidence from which a judge could find that you, through your conduct, consented to the search in this case, correct? I honestly don't know if there's a policy. It's just the way it's worked, and, and, and well, I comply. Well, let's look at Shapiro and Clark. Okay. W what evidence was there in the records in those cases for the court to find, based on the totality of circumstances, that there was consent? Shapiro You've and relied on both of them. Those are the airport case. Oh, okay. And, and that's the, well, pris and, and that's and the prison guard case. And, and it's just a... a, a matter of engaging in a, in a course of conduct, as Your Honor pointed out in Skinner. But there was, ev but there was evidence of that in, in Clark and Shapiro, was there not? In other words, there was, a, there was a suppression hearing, and at the suppression hearing, the defendant testified. Correct. And the defendant said, I've been to the airport 20 times. This was on cross-examination, okay, I assume. I, I, I understand that, Your Honor. But then I would go... Do you need... My question is, do you need that sort of evidence here? In other words, even if I accept the proposition, that the statute's not unconstitutional, assuming there is evidence that somebody knew about it, signed their license, looked at their driver's license, understood that driving on the road would subject themselves to this. Maybe it's not their first time, their first rodeo, um, like, it, like in the case of Mr. Shapiro. Um, wouldn't that be evidence indicative of consent? Yes, I believe, Your Honor, it could, but... Is there, are we lacking some of that here? As far as those parts of things, I would as far, as far as any evidence at all to indicate the totality of the circumstances which would allow consent here, other than I drove on the road. Other than he, he drove on the road and agreed to the rules of the game. And if, Do we know he agreed to the rules of the game? Do we know he signed anything? Do we know he even had a license here? Well, we do know he had a license. I believe it was in the okay. in the citations, but I don't a, a copy of the license, Your Honor. I don't believe is in the record on appeal. But again, no, they, I would go. <clears throat> yeah, assume that it's not for purposes. Okay, of I, I would go exactly to Your Honor's. Um, this statute is about a, this statute, as I understand it, applies to out-of-state drivers. We even it assume that to they drivers, know. Drivers, period. Yes, Your Honor. So how can we even assume that they would know what Florida law is on this? I I don't think ignorance of the law is. <laughs> It is a defense. So, uh, I but mean, you, and, and I would you, point it to the, to the context of, you know what, we have a concealed but even, but even, law. But even more, even more fundamentally, though, I mean, how can you analogize from a timing perspective the consent that you, that you say happens when you get a license and you drive on the mm -hmm. roads? How can you compare that to the real-time consent that's always present when I'm walking through a metal detector or you know, choosing to go to an airport or, you know, whatever. I mean, it just seems like completely different circumstances. The bottom line is, in this case, the person's unconscious, Correct. and by definition, there's no real-time consent. But, but Your Honor is assuming that because I initially consented and got on the roadways and, that, and then put myself in the condition of given. These are extremely narrow circumstances where not only do they have to have probable cause that you were DUI. But it, but it seems that even under the statute, even under the implied consent statute, you still have, there's one more sort of safe haven, which is you still have the ability, if you're conscious, to say, I am refusing Correct. for you to do a, draw a blood test. Correct? Correct. If you're but, conscious, but, you, you can so do that. So you have the ability to do that, but how then, so to me it's sort of problematic because you, it almost seems like even within the, the implied consent statute, you have the original consent that you're giving and you still have the ability to say no if you're stopped. But right. if you're unconscious, you don't have that second ability. Well, and um, to, to respond to your question, Your Honor, I, I guess it would be, I, I would direct your case to Mitchell, which is pending before the U.S. Supreme Court, and, and one of the parts of their analysis was, look, you've all consented, and that's fine, and they recognize the situation that you pointed out, Justice Lagoa, but they said, hey, well, basically, yeah, um, you put yourself in that situation. You're the one who got on the road. You're the one who drunk, drank, drove, drove drunk, 
knock yourself out or put yourself in a condition. And then in Florida, we have an even further stat, which I think makes it much more reasonable, is you have to present to a hospital. Council, but council you, have, yes. you have exhausted your time. Um, thank you, Your Honors. I would appreciate it, and uh, I would res respect the court to affirm. Thank you. Your Honors, I'd like to address the remainder of my time to the good faith exception. Uh, as Justice Lawson touched upon, the holding in Carpenter was pretty clear. Quote, the rule on searches in questionable areas of law is simple and unequivocal. Get a warrant. Uh, the state assumes too little of our police officers. As the United States Supreme Court recognized in Davis, responsible law enforcement officers will take care to learn what is required of them under Fourth Amendment precedent and will conform their conduct to these rules. For that reason, police have police academies. They are instructed on the law, and one of the first things they, they know is that the Constitution controls. So looking at an officer in the position of, of, and just to address one thing first off, the state says that this statute has been in effect for 50 years, and that is because prior to McNeely's issuance in 2013, this court's precedents held that there was no constitutional impediment to doing a warrantless blood draw. So we have an officer in Officer DeSantis' position. They're going to see that McNeely has stated that exigency is not a per se exception, is one that has to be done on the totality of the same circumstances. The officer in this case knows there's no exigency. The only thing he can rely upon is implied consent. And the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence of Williams and Lyle. So are you suggesting that in order to find the good faith exception applicable here, we would need to recede from Carpenter? No, I'm not asking this court to recede from Carpenter. I know you're Carpenter. not asking us to. But, uh, I'm certainly not asking this court. But, but you're, you're arguing that, that the analysis and holding in Carpenter would would not allow application of the good faith exception here, correct? I'm saying that the good faith exception in this case applies under Carpenter's analysis because the decisions in Williams and Lyles through this area of law, and including McNeely, had thrown this area of law into a state of flux where relying on implied consent would be very questionable. And as the United States Supreme Court said in Johnson, uh, United States versus Johnson, 1982, law enforcement would have little incentive to err on the side of constitutional behavior unless there is a good, unless the exclusionary rule applies. So an officer in Officer DeSantis's case, at the time of the search, the only thing he could rely on is implied consent, and the case law said statutory implied consent is not equivalent to Fourth Amendment consent, and that a defendant does not necessarily consent to a breath test when he got behind the wheel of this car. It was not reasonable, Illinois v. Kroll says that an officer cannot rely on the statute if they reasonably know that it cannot be constitutionally applied, and I believe that principle should be applied in this case, and, this case, and that these, this court should reverse. Thank you very much. We thank you both for your arguments. Court is now adjourned. All rise.